So today we're talking about causality. Um, few announcements before we get to that. So no homework this week. We're just gonna give you guys the week off. Uh, discussion's also optional this week. And um, we're gonna extend vitamin three, vitamin 23 rather, to Friday. Um, midterm scores are out as well. And we're gonna have a mid semester grade report out for you later this week. So this will kind of go over the distribution of all the scores. It's also gonna go over the distribution of all of the kind of overall scores, like grades in the class. And we'll just kind of present that to you guys in the right context, kind of go over what everything means. Um, so we'll go over that later this week. And yeah, I mean, just a couple of things to go over for the midterm. I know there's been a lot of discussion on Piazza about this. Um, you know, a lot of people thought that uh, the midterm didn't really give people a chance to really accurately reflect their understanding of the material in the course. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to say a couple things about that. So first of all, I totally understand how that feels. Um, when I went through my PhD program, we had some qualifying exams and there was one exam on theoretical probability and I just felt like I got cheated. Like I didn't, I didn't get to reflect my understanding of the material. It didn't really cover, you know, like kind of, everything that I thought was going to be covered and just it just felt like an unfair exam I didn't do that well I had to take it again actually um, and the second time around it was fine and um, you know things were reflected well but it happens I understand how it feels um, but uh, you know just know that you know we're we're gonna you know adjust for things we're also learning to ourselves you know just like for many of you this was your first online exam potentially for, you know, for Professor Wagner and I, you know, this is like one of our first time teaching online as well. So we're still trying to like calibrate exactly how difficult the exam should be, um, you know, based on being an online format versus in person. So I feel really confident we're gonna get to, um, you know, a good, a good final exam for you guys. And you have plenty of opportunities to show your knowledge in this class. Again, midterms are only 15% of your grade. There's still so much more um, beyond that. So don't let that single, performance like define you or anything like that. Um, have a lot of opportunities still. Cool. All right, so for weekly goals for this week. Um, so today we're talking about causation. It actually just continues some of the discussion we had last week in terms of um, looking at two samples and comparing numerical data between two samples. So. In that case, we were able to conclude association, but we couldn't conclude causation. We'll go over that today. How do we actually establish causation? Um, and this is done through randomized control experiments. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll go into uh, estimation again. So we've talked about estimation so far, which is like you're trying to understand some Cranberry population and you use your sample data to do that. So we'll go over how we did that. And um, we'll also talk about confidence interval. So how can we express kind of what kind of confidence we have in our estimates. Cause we talked about how estimates jump around and you know, are variable. Um, and then on Friday, we'll talk about how we can actually interpret confidence levels. Um, and yeah, guys, we're trying to focus on the lecture now. So please let's try to keep the chat a little bit to a minimum so we don't distract everybody. Um, otherwise we're gonna have to make it just to the host. Thanks. Um, all right, so for comparing two samples, this is something that we kind of started last week. So um, an example that we had last week, it was, you know, all of the babies and we were basically looking at the weights of the babies when they were born and trying to see if there was a difference between the weights of the babies um, whose mothers smoked during pregnancy and whose mothers did not smoke. Um, and so these were kind of the two hypotheses that we were testing. So the null hypothesis was that in the population, the distribution of the birth weights of the babies in two groups are the same. Um, and so any differences that we see in the sample is just due to chance. Like we just happen to select, um, you know, smoking mothers who had lighter babies just by chance. And then the alternative um, was that in the population, the babies are the mothers who smoked way less on average than the babies of non-smokers. So this is like, she's basically gonna get a conclusion about the population, that there is some difference there in the population itself. So that was kind of what we went over in last lecture. Um, and so just to kind of recap how we did that. So we created a couple of functions to help us do this. So first of all, we had this function called difference of means um, where we basically pass in 
the table that we want to calculate the difference of means of, and then we pass in the numeric label as well um, of the column that we want to calculate the mean of. So in that case, it was birth weights. That was the particular numerical variable that we cared about. And then we also have the group label, which basically tells us what are the categories that we want to calculate the differences between. So we wanted to calculate the difference in birth weights between smokers and non-smokers. So in that case, the group label was smoker. And then so that's kind of the arguments to this function. And then what does the function do? Well, first of all, it takes our table of all of our columns and it just selects the two columns we care about. So the numerical column and the categorical column. Um, and then what it says is, okay, now we have our table of just the two columns that we care about. And then it says, let's actually calculate the average value of the numerical variable for each category. So let's calculate the average birth weight for smoker and non-smoker. How do we do that? Well, if we have our table with just those two columns, we can call group and then um, group on the category and then using np.average, which will essentially take the average of the numerical column. So that's gonna take the average of the birth weights for the smoker and the non-smoker. And then finally, it's gonna return, um, or fi finally, we're gonna grab just the averages. Cause if you run group, if you remember, when you run group, it gives you the unique values of the category and then like either the count or in this case, the average value of uh, birth weight for each of the unique categories. So we wanted to get just the means, which is the second column and then just take a difference of the means. So that's what the last step here does. Um, and so we're gonna use this function again today with another example, but this is just kind of going over the function that we used in the last lecture. Um, and then once we had this function to create, to calculate the difference of means given you know, a table of data, then the, then the next thing to do was figure out, okay, how can we actually simulate a new set of data that looks like ours and that is a, you know, effectively a simulation from the null hypothesis where we assume that the distributions are the same. Um, and so to create that table, we realized that, oh, well, if we have our actual sample, we can't really go out and easily get more data of you know, additional babies that were born in the world. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use our existing sample, but we're just gonna shuffle the labels around. So that's one way to simulate from the null. And then we created a function here called one simulated difference, which does that for us. Um, so we can review this function as well. Um, and so this function, the arguments were exactly the same as the other function, taking the table of data, the numeric label that you care about and the categorical label that you care about. And then what we did was we said, okay, let's take um, our table and let's sample the entire table with replacement equals false. So when we do that, we effectively like just resample the entire table and you get all the rows again, but in a different order. And then we just take the group label um, from that shuffled table. So the reason we did that was because we really want to just shuffle the smoker and non-smoker column. That's the only column we want to shuffle. But in order to shuffle that, we have to first shuffle the entire table and then take out that column that we care about from the shuffled table. So that's essentially what this is doing here. Um, and then we just store that shuffled uh, smoker column into shuffled labels. And then we created a new table that has the numeric values that we care about, in that case, birth weights, along with the new shuffled column. So now you've basically taken birth weight from the original table, and then you have this like newly shuffled smoker, non-smoker that you attach to it. So now you've essentially just shuffled the smoker, non-smoker label for each baby. And so now that you have both of them together, now you have this new data set that you've created now all you have to do is pass that new data set into the difference of means function. And that's just gonna return the difference of means for that new data set that you created. And so this is one way to essentially simulate a single difference. Um, so any questions about that? Uh, what does dot com group label exactly do at the end for a shuffled statement? So, um, so I think you're talking about this right here. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna take whatever is before this. So whatever is here, this is a table. So it's gonna say whatever this table is, just take the column, um, the categorical column. So in this case, the categorical column is smoker, not smoker. And we did with replacement equals false because we wanted to shuffle the entire table. So we went to like randomly shuffle all the rows of the table and then just take out the column corresponding to smoker, non-smoker, because that's really what we wanted to shuffle is the smoker, non-smoker. Um, so I'm just gonna run these two functions because we're gonna use them again later. 
And then um, we can just take a look at this data set again that we had last time. So again, we had like birth weights, gestational days, maternal age, and so on. And so we mainly cared about birth weight and maternal smoker. And so what this function did was it would shuffle the entire table. It would create like a new table that's a shuffled version of this table, but then it would just take this column out, the maternal smoker. That's the group label column in our case. So it would just take the maternal smoker column out. Now we have a shuffled version of maternal smoker, and then we can create a new table that has um, the original birth weight column with the newly shuffled maternal smoker column. So put those together. That's one way to simulate um, a new data set. And then we repeated that process like 2,000 times to simulate 2,000 different versions of the data. Um, and so our conclusion in the end for that study was that the difference in means between birth weights of non-smokers and smokers was statistically significant. And um, we basically said that the data was consistent with the alternative, that the distribution of the weights of babies coming from smokers is less than the distribution. On, on, on average, it's less than um, the weights of babies coming from smokers. And um, we basically said that this basically implies that there's an association between birth weight and um, whether the mother smokes during pregnancy. But that wasn't enough to say that there was a causal relationship. So we couldn't say that smoking causes the birth weights to go down. And why is that? Well, so look, to give you some intuition for that, first of all, let's take a look at the average values of all of the columns between smoker and non-smoker instead of just birth weight. So I'm going to call this births.group maternal smoker. So basically, let's group our table by the unique values of maternal smoker. And then let's calculate np.average for all of the columns. And so let's see if you notice anything interesting here. So um, of course, this first column here is what we basically use for our analysis. So we had that, you know, if you don't smoke, average birth weight was 123. If you do smoke, average birth weight was 113. So this was that this was like our observed test statistic basically with the difference in these two. But then if you look at some of these other columns, they also have some noticeable differences. Like for example, the maternal age is you know one year more for non-smokers versus smokers. Um, the pregnancy weight is also more for non-smokers versus smokers. So it's kind of interesting. Like these also have some differences that maybe could be statistically significant. I mean, we'd have to do a test to really verify this. But it's interesting, like you see this difference here, but there's also these other differences in these other columns as well. Um, and so basically what that's, what that's telling you is that, yes, there's a difference between these two groups in the sense that you know one smoked and one didn't, but there's also other differences here as well um, in terms of like the weight of the mother or the age of the mother. And maybe those things are what are causing the birth weights to be lower. It's not actually the smoking. Um, and so when you see a situation like this, these are called confounding factors. So basically you have these other things that are also potentially could be causing the association that you're seeing. And so this is typically why just, just finding an association between two variables isn't enough to actually prove that they are um, causing one, one another. You need to actually um, you know, account for the variation that there could be in all the other variables as well. Um, and so hopefully that makes some sense at least. So basically that's kind of the reason why we can't say there's, just, there's, a, um, there's a causal relationship. It's just an associative relationship. Um, and so it might seem like, well, then I have to check like every possible other variable out there in order to prove causation. So you don't actually have to do that. There is a systematic way you can do it. Um, but it basically involves a slightly different process of how we observe the data. Um, and so we'll go over that next. But before continue, just wanted to see if there's any other questions about this as we're kind of recapping this or any questions about why we can't assume causation still. Um, yeah, okay, so I can just go over that reason again. So basically, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, the main reason why you can't is because these women self-selected whether they were gonna smoke or not. So, um, you know, we didn't choose for them whether they smoked or not, they chose themselves. 
And so there could have been other reasons in their life that led them to make that decision to smoke. And so those other reasons might also be correlated or might be causing um, the birth weight to be lower. Like for example, here you have women who are lighter um, also tended to be the ones who had who smoked. So maybe it's like, I don't know, women who weigh less smoke more often or something. And then women who weigh less also have lighter babies. So, you know, just making that up, but like maybe that's, that's what happened here. So the, that's really what it comes down to is that we didn't choose for them whether they smoked or not. They chose themselves. And if they chose themselves, there's a bunch of other factors about their life, other variables about them that might have influenced their decision to smoke. And those other factors might have been the same things that actually cause the birth rates of the babies to be lower. So in that sense, it looks like smoking might have been what caused it, but actually there's all these other factors and other experiences that might have caused um, the birth rates to be lower. And so if you really wanted to assess whether smoking actually causes, is the single cause for birth weights being lower, you have to find a set of women and then specifically ask some of them to smoke and specifically ask some of them not to smoke. And you have to assign them and force them to do it. And it's completely unethical. You wouldn't be able to do that, but that's, that's kind of what, that's the really the true way that you'd be able to establish causation. Um, because then you can take away any other factor that's contributing to it. You take away anything from their life experience, any other variables that could be contributing to the weights being lower, because basically those same people appear in kind of both of your groups. Um, and that's kind of the right way to do it. And then we, to kind of show you why that's important, we just showed a few examples here of other variables that also have these kind of like interesting differences. Um, but that's, that's basically what it comes down to is that we just observed what they did. We didn't actually control what they did. And so random assignment is really what it comes down to. So you have to randomly assign like who goes into what. And so um, to use another example for this, so this is um, some data on like smartphone um, app usage, as well as the share of spending. So uh, most of you are probably familiar that, you know, Android has the biggest market share in the smartphone space, like globally, there's way more people who use Android than iOS. Um, but if you look at the share of spending worldwide, it's a lot more um, towards iOS or specifically here it says the app store versus the play store, basically the same thing. So it's interesting, like you have, it's, I think it's like 80% of the world uses Android, but then 60% of the spending comes on iOS. So that's kind of interesting. And so you might be asking, well, does this mean that like iPhones make you spend more money or something? Like is, is Apple just like forcing you to spend more money on apps? Like why are people spending more, right? And so it's hard to say whether that's actually the case um, because there's other factors that could be involved there. And because people are choosing to buy these phones themselves. Um, that's really what it comes down to. So, you know, that's really the question is, is higher spending caused by people owning an iPhone? But you can't really tell because they aren't randomly assigned to the phone. So other factors could be contributing to their purchasing decisions. Um, you know, people who have iPhones tend to be higher income in general. So, you know, that could be why they spend more. People with higher income just spend more money. Um, other thing is, um, at least in the US, like iPhones are a lot more popular in the US than they are in other countries. And the US is probably like home to the biggest set of consumers in the world. People save a lot less money in the US and they spend a lot more. So maybe that's just in the culture. Like people who are American just tend to buy more things in general. And then they happen to buy iPhones. So that's why you get that correlation. So if you wanted to truly understand whether this device is actually causing people to spend more money, how would you actually do it? What you'd wanna do is get a set of people and then randomly assign some people to, to use an iPhone, some people to use an Android and then see what happens. And that's how you could truly establish whether there's a causal relationship, because then you're keeping all the other factors basically the same for both sets of people. You're just taking a bunch of people and you have, you know, some high income people in both groups. You have some low income people in both groups. You have some Americans in both groups. It's like basically the same, but the only difference really then is whether they're using one device or the other. So you basically essentially control for all the other things that could be happening. Um, and so that's essentially how we actually do that. And so this is how we establish causality. Um, and so this process of like choosing for them what they use or choosing for them what the value of the variable is essentially is called a randomized control experiment. Um, and so this is actually really common. Um, and this is typically what's also used um, when we're establishing like efficacy of vaccines, for example. 
Um, and so in this setup, essentially, we actually have essentially two samples. So we have sample A, which is going to be our control group, and then we have sample B, which is going to be a treatment group. And basic idea is that if the treatment and control groups are selected at random, then you can make causal conclusions. Um, and then any difference in outcomes between the two groups could be due to two things. Either it's just by chance, um, or it's actually due to the treatment itself. And so it's just a much stronger um, conclusion that you can make from a hypothesis test in this case. So you know this is just a different way of getting data. Rather than going out and observing a bunch of people and just seeing who happens to be in, who happens to like have a particular value for this category, what we're going to do is we're going to go out randomly select a bunch of people. But then once we randomly sample a bunch of people, we are then also going to randomly decide some of them to take a specific value of this variable and then some of the others to take a different value of the variable. So that's the main difference here. And so this is not an, this is like not called an observational study. The other case would be considered an observational study. Um, and so let's take a look at an example of data set that we're going to use today. So let's just read this in. Um, and so this has uh, some data on a bunch of patients who use who are undergoing some pain in like specific parts of the body, and um, they're basically trying to understand whether Botox could be an effective treatment for that pain, or at least mitigate the pain a little bit. Um, and so they decided to do a randomized control experiment where they got a bunch of people who um, are experiencing a specific kind of pain. And then they randomly divided up that sample into two groups. And then one group got the Botox, um, one group did not, they got a control. So they got something that was like basically not Botox, the placebo essentially. Um, and so we basically here observe two things. We observe what group they're in. So are they control or, or treatment? And then we also observe the result, which is whether they, the pain improved or not. So it's a one if the pain improved, it's zero if the pain did not. So we can see here, for example, um, this first set of people, they were all control, so they didn't get any treatment. Um, some of them did improve, but looks like most of them did not improve in pain. And then we keep scrolling down. We have a bunch of people who got the treatment. So in this case, we, we're seeing a lot more ones here um, and a lot fewer zeros. So it seems like just by eyeballing it, looks like people who got the treatment seems like they had more improvement in general um, than people who did not. Um, and so, if we wanted to actually look at, you know, eyeballing is great, but it'd be nice to also just count up like the unique um, times each of these different like uh, categories appear. So, how often does control with a result of one appear? How often is a control with a result of zero appear? If you wanted to see like all the unique values of these combinations, what's what's one thing we could do to to kind of see that? And we want to again, we want to look at not just unique values of control and treatment, but combinations of treatment control and like zero one result. So it's kind of unique values of the combination of two variables. Yeah, so it's pivot. Um, so let's take a look at that. So if you use pivot here, we can do Botox dot pivot result and group. And so now here we're gonna have um, on the bottom, we have group, which is the unique values of group, so control and treatment. And then we have the unique values of the result, which is like, did the pain and group or not? So zero or one there. Um, and then we can see there's basically 14 people who got the control who did not improve, two people who got the control who did improve, and then six people who got the treatments who did not improve, and then nine people who got the treatment who did improve. So this makes it even like clear the difference here. So you know it's like 14 versus two in terms of people who did not improve within control, but then within treatment, it's like six versus nine. So you know, majority of people did improve in the treatment, whereas majority of people in the control did not improve. So we can see the difference there. Um, and then if we wanted to actually calculate the average improvement um, for each of the categories, that's where we could use group. So we could do botox.group, and then we're going to use just group, which is the, the column that we care about. And then we'll just take the average of the other column that's in the table. In this case, it's just one other column in the table, um, which is the result. And so if we run this, we can see the difference in the averages here. So basically, 
um, everything in, in results is either zero or one. So you take, you can just take the average of that. And so essentially um, the average for control, average improvement, you could say was 0.125, whereas average improvement for treatment was 0.6. So clearly some difference here. But again, as we just said, there is a difference um, and, and we randomly assigned who gets control and treatment. So we'll build an established causation here if there is if this difference is significant. Um, but again, this difference could be due to a couple things. It could either be due to causation or it could also be just due to chance. Because by chance, you might have just gotten some people in the treatment group who happen to be really receptive to Botox for whatever reason, um, because of you know their biology. Like we just that's just by chance. And so if we wanted to actually assess whether this difference is real, whether it's actually significant, um, we need to do a hypothesis test ultimately to do that. So just looking at this table isn't enough. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do next. So there's 31 people in this table. And so let's just take a look at what, um, what's the actual breakdown of what's happening here. So, um, you know, Basically, in the population, we could say our population of what, what can happen in this particular case, there's actually almost like two parallel universes of what can happen. Um, and so in the population, you can imagine we have like one ticket for each of the 31 participants in the experiment. And so you have like this outcome if they were assigned to the treatment and then as outcome if they're assigned to the control. And every participant has this, like every individual person actually has two potential things that could happen to them. Um, you know, if they get the treatment, they're going to have some result, and then if they get the control, they're going to have some result as well. So it's actually kind of two parallel universes for every single person in our study. Um, and so these are both called potential outcomes. Um, but what's going to happen, though, is that we're not actually going to be able to observe both outcomes. That's not possible. Like, we can't observe two universes. So, you know, if I was to take um, treatment versus control, you're only going to observe one of those outcomes for me. You can't do both to me. Um, and so what we're going to do is we can't do both. We'd love to do both in an ideal scenario, but we can't. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to take our sample and then randomly see one of the kind of outcomes of the universe for, you know, some of them. And then for the other people, we're going to see the other outcome of the universe. So that's essentially what's happening here. So for in this particular case, 16 were randomly picked um, where we could see what outcome happens if they get the control. And then 15 were randomly picked where um, we got to see what the outcome is when they're assigned to treatment. And so this is kind of the best we can do um, given the circumstances. So any questions about that before we continue? Okay. So, oh, one question. Um, how do we know the outcomes beforehand? We don't actually know the outcomes beforehand. So the idea is there's kind of two theoretical outcomes. Like you, if you take um, the first person in our, in our data set that we were just looking at, right? That person has some actual result that would have happened if they got the treatment and they have some actual result that would have happened if they got the control. There's some theoretical thing that's gonna happen to them. We don't know what it is, but there is like some theoretical thing that's supposed to happen based on which one they get. But in reality, we can't try both things. We can only give them the treatment of the control. So we're only gonna observe one of those things. Um, and so that's kind of what we can do here is the best we can do is observe one of them. So what we're gonna do is just randomly split up our data set and then half of them will give them the treatment, half of them will give them the control. If let's say we had some way to observe like parallel universes, what we would actually do is we would take all 31 people and we would give all 31 people the treatment in one universe and we give all 31 people the control in another universe. And then we look at the results of all 31 people and compare them. So that's what, you'd, that's what you would want to do ideally, but that's not physically possible. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of split things up and like half of them will get to see the treatment, half of them will get to see the control. And that's the kind of the best we can do. Um, and then why is it 15 and 16? It's just because that was like roughly half. So we just picked to randomly assign roughly half of them to treatment, roughly half to control. Um, and the number that you assign a treatment and control actually doesn't matter that much, but you kind of want them to be probably like similar sample size wise. Um, but the fact that they're different here is okay. Like if it's 16 to 15, that's perfectly fine. The most important thing is that 
when we actually want to try to simulate from the null distribution, we're going to want to make sure that this breakdown is exactly the same. You're going to have 16 who are in the control and 15 who are in the treatment. So we just got to make sure that is going to be the same for our simulated data sets. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. But otherwise, breakdown actually isn't that important. Um, are the control and treatment subjects chosen randomly? Uh, yeah, so we randomly assign people to one or the other. Um, do people in the treatment need to be told that they're in the treatment? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, typically, you actually don't want to tell people that they're in the treatment of the control because then, you know, they might um, they might have like some psychological impact on their recovery or their pain. They might just like think that they feeling be that they're feeling better even though they're not. So typically you don't actually wanna tell people um, whether you're in the treatment or control. Yeah, exactly. So someone mentioned this is what happens with the placebo. So that's the whole idea of the placebo is that you're telling everybody that they're getting treatment essentially, but no one really knows whether they're getting it or not. Um, and so typically when people report like, oh, I'm feeling a lot better, even though you give them nothing, that's a placebo effect. So that's like, they're just thinking that they got better even though they didn't. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to probably just not tell anybody anything and just say you may or may not be getting the treatment. Um, and then you also want to find a way to measure that pain or that improvement objectively as well. That's also important. And then as you and I mentioned, not only do you not want the participants in the study, but people in your sample to know whether they got treatment control, it's also typically useful for the people conducting the experiment themselves also to not know whether they're giving. So it's like, if I'm a nurse in this experiment, I don't even know if the shot I'm giving you has the Botox or not. Um, and so when, when neither the um, people in the study and the people running the experiment know, that's called a double blind study. So basically both, both parties are blind to like what's actually happening. All right, um, so let's now actually talk about how do we test the hypothesis. Um, and so first of all, when we're testing the hypothesis, we gotta figure out what our hypotheses are. So our null hypothesis in this case, we're gonna say is that in the population, the distribution of all potential control scores is the same as the distribution of all potential treatment scores. So again, you know, out in the real world, when people experience their pain, they're gonna do one or, one or the other thing. They're either just not gonna take any treatment or they are gonna take some Botox. Those are basically like the two things that they could do. Uh, and they're gonna do one of those two things when they get some pain. And so the idea is we're not gonna be able to observe both of those things. They're not gonna be able to observe both of those things, but we're gonna make some assumptions here. Um, and so the null hypothesis, we're gonna assume that the distribution of all potential scores um, when you have the control is gonna be the same as the distribution of all potential scores when you have the treatment. So basically what this means is the treatment has no effect. That's essentially what the null hypothesis is saying. So if distributions are the same, regardless of whether you get the treatment or not. Um, and then the alternative is gonna say that in the population, more of the potential treatment scores are one than potential control scores. So again, this is, hypothesis needs to be a kind of statement about the population. So this is what we're saying here. Um, so someone's asking, why is the null a distribution, but the alternative is just an amount? Um, so this is typically when you have like numerical data, this is typically how we'll word it in the sense that in the null, you'll say that the distributions are the same. And then the alternative will have to make something, some simplification of that. Cause you can't really say like distribution is like more than, like it doesn't really mean anything. So you just simplify it to like, you know, is the average more than like, what is it? What is, how are these distributions different? So in the case of the um, smoking example, the null was also the distribution of birth weights are the same in the population. The alternative was that um, the average weight is lower for smokers versus non-smokers. So you have to simplify the distribution to some number typically when the alternative hypothesis, um, because you can't just say like the distribution is like lower than the other. That doesn't typically, like we don't really use that language typically, like distribution is lower than another. That doesn't, isn't really language that we use. Um, but you can say the average of the distribution is lower than the average of the other, other things distribution. Um, can't you just say the distribution is not the same for the alternative? You could say that. Yeah, actually you could. Um, in this case, we're, we're 
you know, the experimenters are trying to make a very specific claim that like, this is actually going to help you. So that's why the alternative in this case is going to be very specific. They're going to say our, our alternative is actually that um, the treatment scores are better than the control scores on average. So it's a strong claim. Um, that's just kind of this alternative they choose that they chose. And so again, in, in actual practice, like your alternative hypothesis depends on kind of the context of the study you're working on, the other researchers you're working with, the other domain experts that you're working with, and like, what are you trying to prove? So it's all just contextual. Okay, so let's actually now um, think about how we might test this hypothesis. So we're actually gonna basically go about it in the exact same way that we did the case of the smokers and the birth weights. So first of all, let's take a look at what our observed test statistic is. So, um, or actually, let me take a step back. Let's, let's think about what our test statistic is going to be itself. So um, in this case, we're gonna use actually the similar statistic as last time. It's gonna be the difference in means. So it's gonna be the difference in means between you know, people who take Botox and people who do not take Botox. Um, and so we can observe what the difference is in our sample, first of all. So we're gonna use the same function again, difference of means. In this case, the table is Botox. The numerical variable is the results, which is the improvement in pain. And the categorical variable is group, which is basically treatment and control. And so we can observe the difference here. And so this observed difference here is 0.475. Um, so that's treatment minus control. And so you can see here, treatment is 0.6, control is 0.125. Um, and so again, in this study, we randomly assigned some people to get a treatment, some people to get the control. Neither groups knew what they got. No one knows actually what they got. So everybody basically thinks they're getting it. Um, and despite everybody thinking they're getting it, there was this really large difference in the improvements between both of the groups. So we know that this isn't just like a placebo effect. Um, but this, this could still be due to chance. It could be just, we just happened to select people who responded better to Botox. Um, and so in order to assess whether this difference 0.475 is actually significant, we need to simulate from the null hypothesis, assuming the distributions are the same, and then see the difference in the scores when we simulate, and then see how often we get a difference as crazy or as extreme as 0.475. So if we wanted to simulate one difference, from, um, from the null hypothesis, we can use our function that we defined last time, one simulated difference, and then we're gonna call it in exactly the same way that we call difference of means. And again, what is this function gonna do? It's gonna take our data set of, you know, control treatment column and then result, and it's gonna shuffle control and treatment, but keep the results where they are. And then after shuffling the control and treatment labels, it's gonna calculate the average results in the control group and the treatment group and then see how different that is. Because we said that's a good way to simulate that the distributions are the same. Just shuffle the labels because labels shouldn't even matter if the distribution is the same. So let's do one simulated difference. And so in this particular case, we got a difference of negative 0.17, which means that in this particular case, the treatment actually did worse than the control. Um, and what we can run it again. Now we got something where the treatment did just a little bit worse than the control, so negative 0.04. Run it again. Now we got something 0.0875, so treatment did a little bit better than the control. And so again, here we're going to see it jump around a lot because this is assuming that the treatment and the control are the same. There is no effect from the treatment. So that's why sometimes you're going to see negative values. Sometimes you can see positive values because that is the assumption we made in the null hypothesis. So this seems to be doing a reasonable job of simulating from the null. And so the last step finally is, okay, we know how to simulate from the null. We have our observed test statistic. Now let's just simulate from the null a bunch of times and then see where reality, our observed test statistic, compares to kind of theory, which is the um, simulated values. So to do that, we're gonna do kind of the standard thing that we always do. So we start with this array, we're gonna call it simulated differences. And then um, 10,000 times, we're gonna first calculate a single simulated difference and then just append that to the simulated differences array. So we can run this. So this is gonna do 10,000 simulations of this experiment. Um, again, assuming 10,000 simulations, assuming that treatment has no effect. And then we will put this all into a table. Um, so we're gonna have this table, it's just gonna have one column, which is distance between groups. 
and it's going to have the simulated differences, and then we'll uh, make a histogram of these simulated differences. And so now these are the simulated differences we get. So again, what are we visualizing here? We're visualizing the difference between treatment and control that we would expect to see if there is no effect from the treatment. Like if the treatment's completely useless, this is what we should see. So sometimes you're gonna get, by chance, you're gonna get differences as low as negative 0.4. Sometimes by chance, you're gonna get differences as high as 0.4. And why did we do this? The reason we did this was because we observed an actual difference of 0.475, and we wanted to understand, is that something that would actually come up just by chance if um, treatment actually had no effect? And this helps us assess that. So this is the kind of distribution that we see. Um, and again, we said our alternative hypothesis was that um, the treatment actually improves, you, improves your pain compared to the control. So you should see a positive difference between um, treatment and control. And so that basically means that on this histogram, values that lie more to the right are gonna be more evidence towards um, the alternative hypothesis. So the farther to the right our observed test statistic is, more um, evidence we have for the alternative hypothesis. So we have this observed difference um, of 0.475. And so we know that's gonna lie like somewhere over here on the right. And so if we wanted to actually calculate the p-value for this, we would need to see what portion of the histogram is more extreme than 0.475. So if I wanted to know what portion of the histogram is more extreme than 0.475, how could I do that? So I'm going to count on zero. Yeah, but how could I how could I actually calculate the p-value? That is definition of p-value is the area that's beyond. But how could I actually calculate the p-value? Um, yeah, count up the number of simulated values that's greater than or equal to the observed. So that's what we'll do here. So basically, we can take simulated differences greater than or equal to observed just sum up how many there are, and then divide by the total number of simulations. And so if we calculate this, we get a p-value of 0 0.0073. And so if we were using a cutoff of 5%, this is smaller than that cutoff. So we would um, say that the data is more consistent with the alternative. Even if we we're using a cutoff of 1%, we would still say that the data is more consistent with the alternative. So it doesn't really matter which of those cutoffs you use. Conclusion is the same. Um, Botox does improve the pain. And again, we are able to conclude causality here because um, the way that we generated our sample was that we got some people and then we randomly gave people Botox and some people we did not give Botox. So that's in contrast to um, a situation where let's say we just randomly sampled people who already took Botox and didn't. That would be very different because they chose themselves to take Botox. And there could have been other factors that led them to take Botox. So. Um, that's kind of why we can, we can conclude not just association, but also causation in this case. So one question um, someone had was, why is, why is it that values to the right are more in favor of the alternative? So it depends on the context of your problem. But in this particular case, we said the alternative, let's go back to the alternative. So in this case, it says in the population, more of the potential treatment scores are one than potential control scores. So our test statistic was um, proportion, like average improvement of treatment minus average improvement of control. That's our test statistic. And according to this alternative, it means that more positive values, the test statistic are consistent with the alternative. That's how we know that larger values are more consistent with the alternative. So you need to look at two things when you're determining which side of the histogram corresponds to the alternative. You need to look at what the alternative hypothesis actually is and then what is your test statistic? How is it calculated? And then based on how it's calculated, then you can basically understand, you know, is it large values that are consistent with the alternative? Is it small values? Then you can figure that out. Um, so in this case, we did treatment minus control. That's why large values were consistent with the alternative. In the birth weights case, I believe we did um, smokers minus non-smokers. So in that case, it was actually negative values that were more in favor of the alternative. So 
it just kind of depends on what the alternative hypothesis is and how your test statistic is set up. Um, so what's the difference between A-B testing and randomized control experiment? Really good example. So I think this, this chart here is gonna break this down really well. So there's kind of four different steps to this entire process, whether it's the smoking case where we just observe people or whether it's the randomized control experiment. So when you're looking at two groups of numerical data and you wanna compare that numerical data between the two categories, you're always gonna go through these four steps. So first of all, there's the data generation step. How did we actually get the data? How did we actually get the sample? Um, so there's two ways that can happen. Either you observed it, so you went down the world, you took a sample of people and they already decided what group they're gonna be in. They already decided to smoke or not. They already decided to take Botox or not. That's an observation sample. The other situation is you might do a randomized control experiment. So you observe a bunch of people, but they haven't yet done one of the things. Like they haven't yet decided to smoke or not. They haven't yet um, decided to take Botox or not. And you decide that for them. That's a randomized control experiment. So basically two different ways that you can get your data. Um, once you decide which way you're gonna go, your sample data is gonna look basically the same at that point. Your sample data is essentially gonna be a column of what category they're in, and then a column of what the numerical value is. So that's gonna be exactly the same regardless of which path you come through. So your data is gonna basically look the same, it's the same kind of setup. Um, and because the data looks the same, that means that if you wanna test whether the difference in numerical values between the two categories is significant, you're gonna use the same test. In this case, it's gonna be essentially AV testing. Um, so we're gonna use a permutation test, difference in means. So we're gonna like shuffle the labels and then calculate the difference in means between the shuffled uh, groups. So that's gonna be how we simulate from the null, regardless of whether it's a randomized control experiment or it's an observational sample. And so again, the reason we do that is because we have um, two samples of numerical data from two different categories. That is what decides what test we use. So this, the nature of what our sample data looks like, that's what decides which hypothesis test we use. It actually has nothing to do with how the data was actually generated. Um, and so finally to conclude, once you have you know, your hypothesis test, let's say you do conclude that there is a statistically significant difference between the two groups, then there's two things you can conclude. Either you can conclude association or you could conclude causation. And so the conclusion is gonna depend on the way the data was generated. So if the data was generated with an observational sample, the conclusion is gonna be association. If it was generated by a randomized control experiment, then the conclusion is causation. So that's the main difference here. Um, so the output really just depends on, um, the conclusion you make really just depends on how the data was generated. But the data itself is gonna look basically identical. The hypothesis testing is also gonna be basically identical as well. So any questions about uh, this process here and the difference between A-B testing versus randomized control experiments? So A-B testing is for both. A-B testing is essentially this process here um, and it's, it's being used for both. So A-B testing is used for observational samples and randomized control experiments. It's used for both. It's not just for one or the other. Um, and in our particular case, we use A-B testing because there's two categories that we're trying to compare the numerical values of. So you have two categories and there's numerical values within each category that we care about. As opposed to like the sample proportions, which is where you, there's like two categories and you're just trying to figure out like how many there are in each category. That's not an A-B test. You're not comparing like something about the two categories. You're just comparing how many there are. That's a very different test. Um, and another good question was, um, does concluding causation imply association? Yeah, so causation implies association. It's just like a stronger version of association, essentially. Um, A-B testing is the name of the process used to shuffle the labels. Sort of, yeah, I mean, the, the process used to shuffle the labels is permutation test, actually. That's what it's called. Um, so you're creating different like permutations of the data. Um, but the entire process of A-B testing is really just like comparing numerical values within two groups. So you can think of that as A-B testing. And then permutation test is like a specific part of A-B testing. Like that's how we do the A-B test.
Um, can you recap the difference between observational study and randomized control experiment? So again, in, in both of these cases, you're observing some, you're not observing data, but you're randomly sampling some data in the world. Um, the main difference in the two is the way in which that category is generated. So the category of like smoking or non-smoking, the category of like taking Botox or not taking Botox. In the observational sample, that category has been self-selected by the people in your sample. They've already decided whether to smoke or not smoke during pregnancy. They've already decided whether to take Botox or not take Botox. They themselves made that decision. Um, whereas in the randomized control experiment, you're almost getting the sample like before they made a decision. So maybe you're getting these women like before they even conceive or something. And then you say, okay, once you have the baby, now some of you go start smoking, some of you don't smoke. That's, that would be a randomized control experiment. It's completely unethical, but that's how you would do that. Um, and in the case of the Botox, again, it's like, okay, we've got some people who have pain. They haven't yet decided to take Botox or not. We're gonna split them up and decide who gets Botox, who doesn't. So that's the main difference there. You choose which um, value of that category they take versus them selecting it already themselves. <laughs>